On the evening of May 5th, 1980, viewers watching the British news were astounded to see men dressed in black and wearing gas masks storm the Iranian embassy in London. After bursting through the upper floor's windows, they overpowered the Iranian dissidents who had taken over the building and rescued the hostages they were holding. It was the first time that the public at large had seen Britain's ace and highly secret special air service in action. The SAS's roots go back to World War II, when in 1941, British and Commonwealth forces were locked in battle with the Germans and Italians in the deserts of Egypt and Libya. David Sterling was a young commando officer recovering in a hospital in Cairo from a parachuting accident. He had time on his hands to ponder the general failure of special forces operations in the Middle East at that time. Sterling believed that attacks by small groups of men should be directed at airfields, supply dumps, and communications in order to disrupt the Axis forces. General Sir Claude Auchinleck, who had recently taken over command of the British forces in the Middle East, heard of Sterling's idea and liked it. He saw it as a useful adjunct to a major offensive that he was planning. Thus, in July 1941, L Detachment of the SAS Brigade came into being in Egypt. The title was to deceive the Axis into believing that a complete British airborne brigade was in the Middle East. One volunteer was six foot four inch Irishman Paddy Main, who already had a reputation for toughness. Another was a young Dane, Anders Lassen, who had already proved himself in the highly secret seizing of three Axis merchant vessels from a Spanish island off West Africa. Crusader, Auchinleck's offensive, had as its main object the relief of the Libyan port of Tobruk, which had been under siege since April. L Detachment's task was to destroy German fighters based on five forward airfields. Sterling and 63 other SAS men took part. Unfortunately, all landed in the wrong place and only a quarter of them reached the rendezvous. A patrol of the long-range desert group, the LRDG, brought them back to safety. When they arrived, Auchinleck's long-awaited attack opened on the 18th of November. Eventually, after much bitter fighting, Tobruk was relieved. The LRDG specialized in long-range reconnaissance deep behind the Axis lines. Sterling now sought and obtained their help in inserting his men in future operations. This began to reap immediate results, and the SAS's tally of destroyed Axis aircraft rose dramatically. There were at the time three French forces fighting alongside the British in Libya. Sterling obtained volunteers from these, and they formed a French SAS squadron. In order to attack Axis ships unloading supplies from Europe at Libyan ports, Sterling took over a group of canoeists, who later formed the Special Boat Squadron. Towards the end of May 1942, Rommel attacked once more. This marked the beginning of two months of desperate fighting, which would see the British driven back almost to the gates of Cairo. It was during this time that the SAS carried out its most ambitious raid to date. The central Mediterranean island of Malta was crucial to British naval operations, but had been under constant air attack for more than a year. Its people were near starvation. In order to enable a vital supply convoy to get through to Malta, Sterling was asked to carry out raids on airfields deep behind the Axis lines in the Derna and Benghazi areas, and also on Crete.
The convoy sailed, but although the SAS destroyed some 50 aircraft, it was not enough to prevent the Luftwaffe from sinking several ships in it. In July 1942, the SAS acquired some American jeeps and armed them with twin Vickers K machine guns and a Browning 0.5-inch heavy machine gun. This was to be the SAS's main transport for the remainder of the war. On the night of the 23rd of October, 1942, Montgomery's 8th Army opened an offensive against Rommel at El Alamein. After 10 days of bitter resistance, the Axis forces had to withdraw. During the subsequent pursuit through Libya, the SAS played a useful role in harassing the Axis lines of communication. When the British troops entered the Libyan capital of Tripoli in January 1943, they found that an SAS patrol was there to greet them. The men of the SAS will return in a moment here on True Action Adventures. Did you? By late 1942, a new campaign conducted by British, American and French forces had opened against the Axis in neighboring Tunisia. A second SAS regiment was formed to operate there. But conditions in Tunisia were very different from the desert with its inevitable open flank, which made infiltration behind the Axis lines relatively easy. Now the Axis defenses were more cohesive and the native population generally hostile. Disaster struck in January 1943 when Sterling set off with a patrol in order to link up with the Allied forces in Tunisia. German troops, which had been hunting the patrol, captured him, and his active war came to an end. In April 1943, the final Allied offensive in Tunisia opened. But the loss of their leader and their recent relative lack of success raised increasing doubts over the SAS's future. The final Axis surrender in Tunisia saw the French squadron return to national command and the special boat squadron detached for operations in the eastern Mediterranean. But the rump, some 250 men under Paddy Main, played a vital role in the British landings on Sicily in July 1943. Thereafter, the SAS fought behind the lines in Italy. Operating with Italian partisans, it maintained a campaign of disruption of German communications. In April 1945, the Special Boat Squadron played an important part in the final Allied offensive in northern Italy. Here died the SBS legend Anders Lassen. He was one of a very few foreigners to be awarded Britain's highest decoration for bravery, the Victoria Cross. During the first months of 1944, the main attention of the Western Allies was focused on preparations for the cross-channel invasion of France. The SAS was reformed in Britain as a brigade, which included no less than two French regiments, two British regiments, and a Belgian squadron. Their role was to cooperate with the French resistance and France's secret army, the Maquis. Some SAS groups parachuted into France just before D-Day. They linked up with the resistance and helped to coordinate their attacks on the German lines of communication to Normandy. The majority dropped with their armed jeeps after the Allies were ashore. From the deep woods of central France, they caused havoc in the German rear areas. Once the Allies broke out of Normandy and throughout the remainder of the war in Europe, the SAS were at the forefront, constantly probing deep behind the German lines.
On the 3rd of May, 1945, they were the first Allied troops to enter the main German naval base at Kiel. But at the war's end, the SAS was disbanded. But in 1948, the British Army found itself committed to a campaign against communist terrorists in Malaya. Locating their bases deep in the jungle proved difficult. A specialist deep penetration unit was therefore formed. In 1951, this became the 22nd SAS Regiment and soon began to achieve results. They developed a method of parachuting into the dense jungle. Landing in the treetops, the SAS men learned to belay down to the ground. Their patrols were prepared to remain in the jungle for up to three months at a time. This required enormous powers of endurance, both physical and mental. By late 1958, the communist terrorist threat in Malaya had been almost eradicated. The SAS was now called on to operate in a very different terrain although it would once more use its jungle skills in Borneo during the mid-1960s, skills that it maintains to this day. The SAS's new area of operations was Oman in the Arabian Peninsula, where the Sultan had asked for British help to deal with the rival. The SAS found themselves operating on the seemingly impregnable Jebel Akhtar Plateau. In a masterly two-month operation, the SAS succeeded in dominating this forbidding feature and overcame the opposition. SAS desert operations continued in the 1960s in the hinterland of Aden before the British withdrawal in 1967. All this served to increase the SAS's desert skills. In the late 1960s, the Sultan of Oman came under threat once more, this time from communist-backed dissidents in the equally barren Dofar region in the west. Once again, the SAS were called in and were given the task of raising and training Dofari irregulars, known as Fergats, to fight for the Sultan. As in other British counterinsurgency campaigns, winning over the people, what was called hearts and minds, was crucial. The SAS approach was based on the four-man patrol, with each having a particular expertise, one man was a linguist, another well-versed in first aid, while the others were experts in communications and explosives. By the early 1970s, however, Middle East terrorism, aimed largely at Israeli targets, had become a serious threat. One of the main terrorist tactics was the hijacking of civil airliners. It was put to the SAS to produce techniques for overcoming these hijackers. Its success was only too clearly demonstrated in October 1977 when Palestinian terrorists hijacked a German Lufthansa airliner. The elite German GSG-9 anti-terrorist unit turned to the SAS for help. Two of its members advised and helped the Germans in their storming of the aircraft at Mogadishu Airport in Somalia and the subsequent rescue of the passengers and crew. The men of the SAS will return in a moment here on True Action Adventures. In Ireland, mainly against Republican terrorists such as the IRA, Casualties had been mounting from ambushes and booby traps. 
Helicopters became the only safe means of transport in some areas. The threat was the same on the streets of Belfast and other urban areas. In 1976, the SAS was called in primarily to gain intelligence on the terrorists. One method it used was for its men to operate from skillfully constructed and cleverly camouflaged blinds. From these, they could watch a particular house or a newly discovered arms cache. They would remain in these blinds for days at a time. Sometimes the SAS was able to mount skillful ambushes, as in May 1987, when an SAS patrol shot dead eight IRA terrorists who were attacking a police station. The hijacking of the Iranian embassy by gunmen in May 1980 developed into a siege which the police were unable to break. Once the SAS were called in, they demonstrated another of their newly acquired skills, the storming of buildings containing hostages. Careful planning, detailed rehearsals, and superb teamwork enabled the SAS to end the siege with the minimum loss of life. The unwanted publicity created an upsurge of volunteers wanting to join the SAS. Set off in pairs at five minute intervals. This is by no means easy. Every applicant goes through a lengthy selection course, which is based on orienteering exercises in Wales' rugged Brecon beacons. These are tests of increasing endurance with the student carrying an ever heavier load on his back. They are designed to test the volunteer's mental just as much as his physical fitness. The SAS is looking for the quietly determined and well-rounded individual, and not the loud-mouthed bully. Such are its demanding standards that only approximately 10% passed the selection course. Among the skills that the SAS soldier learns is free fall parachuting as a means of entering enemy occupied territory without being spotted. Once in hostile territory, the SAS man is trained to live off the land, foraging for his own food. He must be able to evade enemy troops who come searching for him. If an SAS man is captured, he is well trained to resist all forms of interrogation. The 1982 Falklands War saw the SAS once more distinguish themselves, along with their counterparts, the Special Boat Squadron, now part of the Royal Marines. Long before the task force arrived, SAS teams had been covertly landed on the islands. One group was given a task identical to that for which the SAS had originally been formed, 
This was to attack an Argentinian airstrip and destroy the Pokhara ground attack aircraft, as this reconstruction shows. This helped the task force accomplish the initial landings without serious opposition. The SAS also directed British guns onto targets. Such is the caliber of the SAS that their commander in the Falklands, General Michael Rose, was the United Nations commander in Bosnia 12 years later. Another distinguished SAS officer, General Peter de la Billière, commanded the British forces engaged in the 1991 Gulf War. Here, it was the SAS's desert skills which were called upon. SAS patrols penetrated deep into Iraq in order to locate the mobile Scud missile launchers and to disrupt Iraqi communications. The SAS has also been used in troubled Bosnia to help monitor the fighting there and to locate heavy weapons threatening the designated UN safe areas. Thus, the SAS is as busy as it ever has been, and its wide-ranging skills reinforce its standing as one of the world's leading elite units. Whatever challenges face the SAS in the future, its men will meet them as they always have done and live up to their motto, who dares wins. Step in line with the elite German forces of World War II, next on Weapons at War. And tomorrow night, Confederate Army hero Nathan Bedford Forrest is profiled on Civil War Journal at 9 Eastern, 10 Pacific.